Now I'm going to talk about globally, uh, from a global perspective, because we need to put all of this in perspective. We need to understand how, what all of this means and where we fit in this. So the first question again is to ask ourselves when you exercise leadership is, what is the nature of our reality? Now to do that, you want to talk about the, the past, where we were, what's, what was our reality before this happened. We need to talk about now, what's the nature of our current reality, and we need to talk about how the future looks like. Let's start with the reality. I'm going to talk about the reality of life, right? How life was in the 21st century, last November, before December, you know, COVID-19, December 19, started. So how life was at a macro level uh, in, 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 on the planet um, before all this started. First reality, we have created a very complex and complicated world. Our world, human being, is very complex and complicated. Who did that? We did that. Why? Because we have complex mind. It's a blessing that we have this amazing mind, miraculous mind, that can be creative. But at the same time, one of the, one of the, one of maybe one of the precursors is that we have created a complicated world. There are other species go to the sea, to the oceans. There are other species of fish who are in the, you know, hundreds of billions of, you know, of individuals, right? But their life collectively is not as complicated. Our life is complicated. And it's not easy to run a complicated life, right? Globally. The second one, we are super connected. And I know you've heard this many times. But we need to now think of it at a different level of consciousness. We, we need to act accordingly. We're super connected. We're connected at an intra level internally. I mean, imagine if you live in a, you know, work for an office that has 1,000 people in, in, the same, in the same room, in the same floor, or in a city that's 30 million people. This is super connection. You have a virus in that context, then you're infecting hundreds of thousands if you're not paying attention or if you're not aware of it. We're also connected at an inter-level, international level. So the 8 billion people are connected like no other time in history. We're also interdependent. We're not just connected. We rely on each other. So you can't say, I'm not going to deal with other people. You have to deal with other people. And through that interaction, things happen, including the transmission of viruses. The other important point, and that we have been acting as if we are in control. And now, Wake up call, humanity. You are not in control. Nature is in control. Where are all the artificial intelligence systems? Where are all the supercomputers? Where is all the technology? Where is everything that we have been so you know, proud of and we need to be proud of because it's amazing when it comes to trying to control you know, how to live in nature? Where, where are all of these, the technologies that we talk about? How, how are they behaving now in the presence of this single microscopic virus? Nowhere, right? Nature is in control. So that's a wake-up call. We have also been arrogant and very conf overconfident about our ability, our technical ability, our scientific ability. I'm not against science. I love science. Science has saved billions and millions of lives. Of course we have to believe and support science. But it, we can't be overconfident. We can't be blind to this arrogance, right? And we can't be complacent. And what's the proof of being complacent? People over the past years, from Ebola and SARS and Mars and swine flu, have been talking a lot about, you know, shaping up our global healthcare system. Did anybody listen? Maybe some, but not to the, to, not to the right extent. And we can see the consequences now. And our economy has been obsessed by economic development. We have been accept, uh, obsessed by economic development, by being powerful. Now, is that a bad thing? It is not a bad thing, because that's how you create progress. That's how you remove people out of poverty. That's how, you know, you help people have a better life. But we have been obsessed about this. You know, rich, prosperous, uh, financial growth, being more powerful at an you know, organizational country level, that's all fine, right? But we've ignored other important things. So now, we have to move from thinking about talking about this at an intellectual level, right? At an intellectual level, to really integrating this into our consciousness. Why? Because we have been talking, this is not new, but obviously it hasn't really paid off because we're acting as if it's there at an intellectual level, but we haven't acted accordingly. And we have seen the implication of all of this at a human, at, at a human race. Now, I'm going to move now 
to talking about our current reality. How do we look at, a, look at our current reality? Hmm? We are living in a state of chaos. We are living in a state of chaos. And level, there is total local and global panic. Governments, entire governments are reactive. Why? Because people are dying. So we're battling death and we're not prepared. We're not prepared technically to go through this. The hospitals are not prepared. Everybody's talking about you know, the risk of the health, health system breaking down. So that means we're not prepared. We could have been prepared. And getting this to be prepared doesn't cost, it costs a fraction of what we're spending on our military budget globally. It costs a fraction of what we're going to lose, the trillions that we're going to lose now because of the economic uh, impact of what's happening. Very little money, comparatively speaking, we could have fixed, improved our local and you know, domestic local healthcare system. We're not prepared globally. We don't have global protocols of how to deal with this. We're not prepared globally in terms of cooperation and collaboration. All of this is our reality. Look at Europe now, look at Italy, look at France, Germany, look at the UK. Where is a joint combined European Union strategy to deal with this? I'm sure they're talking at some level, but is this the best we can do? If you heard the news, China has sent some, some, you know, some people to help Italy. Russia is sending some. But this is far from being an orchestrated part of a contingency plan that we should have and we could have done at a global level. Chaos, panic. We're also going into a fragmentation. And this is going, I want to emphasize this a little bit. We're going into fragmentation. Instead of acting together as one group, each country now is on its own. In some countries, each village or each town is on its own. They're putting barricades around the towns and they're not allowing anybody to get into the place. Now, there are benefits for this, but on a global level, it's obvious. We have, we're a state of fragmentation. We're going to further disintegration of the world order. In the past, when we had superpowers, there were people, there were countries that were leading the global community. Now, in the absence of that mindset, you know, to, to, where a global leader would emerge, everybody is on their own. And people are doing things, you know, far beyond, far below being optimal, because we're becoming more fragment, fragmented and disintegrated. Where is the UN? Where is the UN Security Council? Where is G7? Where is G20? I am not undermining all the effort that's going behind the scene. But what I'm saying, we could do better. WHO is doing a great job but keeping us involved. But show me a case where we are doing, we are demonstrating or we're manifesting a globally coordinated, orchestrated you know, response to this, just like a beautiful symphony. Far from reality. In fact, in some cases, we're stuck into competition. If each country is trying to do their own vaccine, and maybe there are benefits for that, but maybe it would be more useful also to share all this data. So collectively, all scientists will spread the task on different, on, you know, on each other and work as one team to to come up with one vaccine that can go to all humanity because this is a danger at humanity level. Again, I don't want to underestimate all the effort that's going in that direction, but from what we're seeing and this on the news every day, and you can't avoid that, you can't hide that. We have a challenge when it comes to that thing. Another aspect of our country reality, there is high dependence on authority. This is probably one of the few times in life where I have seen so many countries almost begging the army to take control. So many countries are putting pressure on the government to declare you know, a state of emergency. Basically, what that means is giving their government control at the expense of their freedoms, right, so that they can take control of this. They can take, you know, control of the, of the virus itself and contain it. Now, are there benefits of this? Of course, yes, we're in a crisis situation. But there are also dangers for that, because what starts temporary could, be, could become a long-term issue. And from 9-11, we learned that. From other situations, we learned that. What's a temporary measure that's taken under emergency situation could become a long-term measure. And when you, have, when you give government so much power, of course, the default is that they would like to keep it. And then that will have implications on the way societies are run, because power can easily be um, abused. The other point that is part of our current reality is that we have, in, there is a serious crisis in leadership. In my 
personal view because I've spent my life you know studying leadership and teaching it and writing about it and I wrote 10 books about this is that the, we with the real pressure the real problem here is that we don't have the kind of leadership that can be up to the current level of challenge globally show me somebody just show me somebody who is leading at the global level with humanity all humanity in mind no I understand there are priorities at home and people have to attend their own constituencies that's fine but in these times, also, we need somebody with a global perspective to, you know, to bring the whole world together with all our resources you know, to, so that we can deal with this in a more efficient way. And my thinking is that this is the biggest danger that we have now because it reflects our thinking. This is not an imitation of our, on our abilities. We can do that. There's no problem, technically. We can do that. There's the technology, there's the resources. We have all the brilliant mind that can do all these protocols. But we're failing to do that. Why? Because there's failure of leadership. We need to fix this. If we don't fix this, more of the same will happen, and it will happen even worse than that. I'm going to go speak a little bit now about some technical solutions. These are, I'm going to speak very quickly about them, because they're not the main issues, and they're experts to do that. But since we're talking about this, I'll just mention a few points. We definitely need a better global healthcare system globally, with better global protocols where all countries have to accept. All countries have to accept. There is no compromise. There has to be one protocol to how to deal with these kinds of threats at the global level. The second, we need global health standards that can apply everywhere. Just like there are, there are, uh, there are human, um, uh, human rights watch groups that can talk about the level of human rights you know, uh, 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 at, and the quality of human rights in, in, in the countries of the world, there has to be a certain similar kind of entity, governmental or not governmental, UN or non-UN, that will make sure that a, an accepted global standard of, of hygiene, of health issues, health standards is applied locally, everywhere, in every corner of the world, because it's not a local issue. One problem in one market in China, you know, put 8 billion people in danger. We have to have protocol for sharing information in global crisis. We have to have protocols of sharing research uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to cooperate on this. And this has to be handled at a, at a UN level, at a UN Security Council level. More important than the technical elements, more important than this, we need to handle this at a deeper level. We need to go to the root causes, which is here, the mindset, right? The mentality and the mindset. The technical part is relatively easy. It's not difficult. It's not it's easy, but relatively it's easy. It could be doable because it's an intellectual thing. But when it comes to mindset, this is where proper leadership has to be involved. We have now a rare opportunity as individuals and as collectively together uh, to take to use this wake-up call and think about real solutions. Real solutions. Technical problems will not solve the issue because it will, at best scenario, it will bring us back to the same old normal. Going back to the same old normal is a crime. It is a crime. It's a crime against the lives of all of these who died and all of this trillions of dollars that will be lost and the jobs that will be lost. We have to create a new normal, a new reality, a better standard of reality at a personal level, at a societal level, at a family level, at a humanity level. It's, there, is a law, there is a moral obligation to create a new normal, not to go back to the, different, to the previous normal, a better normal. And for that we need to emphasize on how do we you know, vaccinate the world with, different, with, new, with, value, with important values. We need to think about vaccinating our mindset with the values of collaboration and cooperation versus negative competition. Is competition healthy? Yes. Is it helpful? Yes. But negative competition that involves, you know, me being stronger at the expense of making you weaker, that's not healthy. So we need cooperation more. Individuality is important, but we need also to think, to have a global perspective when we think about things about, you know, shared interests. We need to have a global perspective. We need to put people first. It's all about people. Leadership is all about people. It's about elevating the, the condition of, uh, of humanity, of the human condition. How do we bring, take it up to, to a more dignified life? So it's all about people. These things have to be important, have to be integrated in our thinking, our educational system in the future. We need to think about sustainability for, you know, for all people through long-term thinking. 
equally important, and that's the line of business or of interest that really I, I mean I, I think about a lot is we need a new way of thinking about leadership. The current way of thinking about leadership has is showing us what what's happening. We need to think about leadership in a totally new way. Now, because because at the end it's all about the individual. At the end, it's all about I mean what's a society? A society is a summation of all the individuals. You know, corruption starts at the individual and then it becomes a social issue. We also need to create a better person in terms of values. So we need to work on reshaping the values of people when it comes to the priorities of these values. Values like responsibility, and we can see that for sure now, how important is responsibility towards yourself, taking care of yourself so that you don't become liability to others, and responsibility towards other people. Values of resi resilience, because if you're weak, you will be crushed. Values of courage, because if you're not courageous, you can't take bold decisions. Values of truth, because without truth, only truth will liberate us. Only truth will open the way. Because without truth, you're living in a lie. Values of living a meaningful life, a life of meaning that gives, that justifies the, the, the difficulties of, of life itself. Because only meaning uh, that extends beyond you will justify dealing with all the suffering and the pain and the kind of crisis that we're going through now, losing other people. The values of injecting hope all the time because we cannot afford not to be hopeful. The values of building good characters, right, virtues, and in the end, the values of the importance of creating a new generation of leaders. Leadership that is based on purpose, that's based on values that thinks at this grand level so that all of us together right, can make it. Because without this, as we have seen, without this kind of leadership, right, we're in trouble. Local leaders, small leadership does not work. Does not work. My last point is that I'm optimistic if we learn from this. And I feel that it's our duty to come out of this better. Because we don't want our children to go through this. If we don't, we will live in a crisis, and another crisis, and another crisis, until we get the kind of crisis that we can't handle. And I will close by saying, I believe, I have faith in the power of goodness. I have faith in the power of every good that you do, because it will pay back, you know, multiples to you and to people around you, sooner or later. I have faith in the power of hope, because that's what makes us overcome. And I have faith in the power of love. And this is not a new age thing, because, my friends, look at the nurses who are risking their life to save people. Look at doctors. Look at the generous, generous donations by so many people. Look at the rescue workers. Look at the volunteers. Look at, look at these people who are our main, maybe the only defense line. Are they doing it for money? They are not. They are doing it out of responsibility and love. And in the end, that's what leadership is. Because leadership is love in action. And only love will save us. Thank you so much. I'm open now to your questions. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready. Um, the first question has to do with how do we as leaders, in the midst of all the fear and instability, where do leaders turn for positive energy and calm in ah. the midst of all the panic? Great question. Well, there are measures. This is this is this is non-negotiable because we talk about sustainability, right? So you have to be in good shape, and all this you know, that I am sacrificing, you know, I'm, uh, you know, all of that. This is short-term thinking. You need to stay alive. You need to stay alive. I mean, the classic example is, you know, the oxygen mask in an airplane. You first make sure that you're alive, and then you attend, you tend to your to your child. So you take care of yourself, you make sure that you take care of your body physically, so you eat well and you sleep well. You make sure that you take care of your emotions, you express your emotions, of course not publicly because you don't want people to panic, but you find a support group where you can express these emotions. You want to cry, cry, I mean go and have a shower and cry, 
close the door and cry because it's a human nature thing. So, so express your emotions, talk to your confidant, uh, pray if you want to pray, regardless of what you believe in and who your God is, it doesn't matter. Just connect to a, a reassuring um, center, exercise. So you need to keep your mind alert and healthy by sleeping and by you know um, making sure that you can think properly. You need to keep your body healthy and you need to keep your spirit, your soul also healthy by you know reminding yourself of your purpose, of the meaning that all of this gives you and of the responsibility that you have towards others. And this is not about just about you. It is 50% about you because you have a moral obligation to take care of yourself. But it's also 50% about others because you have a moral obligation to be there for them. Because if you collapse, your family collapses and whoever is using you as a pillar in their life will also collapse. So it's an important part of what being a great leader is all about. There's no selfishness here. This is, this is part of the process of mobilizing people and exercising leadership. And each of us has his own way of doing that. That's why I said, be silent, be quiet, protect yourself from this extra, extra noise. You know, take care of yourself, take care of your sanity. Because you need to think properly. One mistake at your level, other people will pay the price. Like if you're a father, one mistake, big, this bad decision, the whole family pays the price. CEO, the entire company, president, the whole government, the whole... I mean, look at the governments now. Some of them made mistakes, they went in, into this late... And the consequences is that more people have died. And those who went in early, took it earlier, see more seriously, you know, at an earlier time, they saved lives. So you really need to be in good shape so that you can make your assessment um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sound way. Because it's not about you, it's about other people. Beyond our responsibility to, uh, to our families and ourselves, what is our leadership role as citizens towards the poor and unemployed and helpless throughout all this? Well, the answer is, imagine um, if the nurses were selfish. Imagine if the doctors were selfish. Imagine if the nurses said, I'm sorry, but I have children. I cannot risk my children. I do a job, and then I have to go and stay with my kids. Imagine if doctors and rescue people did this. The Red Cross people did this. Imagine supermarkets, you know, food people did this. Imagine. I mean, okay, people care about money, but I don't think to the extent that they would sacrifice their kids. So we have, to, we have to learn from them, and this, they are the source of inspiration. This is an amazing, amazing lesson of exercising leadership with the minimal power that you can have. I mean, these people are not in government. They don't have the power to take big decisions, but they're saving lives. They, without them, we're, all, we're finished without them. So we have to learn from them, and we have to understand that this is the power of meaning. You know, are these people tired? Yes. Are they exhausted? Yes. But the only, are, they, are they feeling under danger? Of course, yes. But the only thing that is keeping them in the game, you know, uh, uh, taking on all the threat, accepting all the sacrifice they're making, they're putting in life in danger. The only thing that we're making is making them do that with a smile, right? And what's striking is that they, they keep saying it's our duty to do so, is a sense of meaning. And meaning can only come from responsibility. So responsibility, feeling responsible is the key because the more you feel responsible towards yourself, especially others, the more your life will have meaning. And the more your life have meaning, has meaning, the more you will be able to be resilient. And the more this, you know, the difficulty of life and sometimes the tragedy of life will be bearable. So the answer is feel responsible. Right? And... Uh, and, and if people don't do that, then it's a disaster because it's not just about you. Imagine if somebody has corona and he knows that and he doesn't have his, he or she doesn't have a sense of responsibility and they're just saying, you know, what the hell, I can go to the supermarket and I talk to people. Um, they, have, I mean, they have their own philosophy. They're nihilist or they're upset or they're angry or they're, you know, malevolent or uh, uh, they're bitter. So uh, it's a serious danger. We cannot live without responsibility and meaning and the, an elevated sense of purpose. That's a danger not only to the person who is doing this, but to the entire community. So our last question 
last question, Michael, is, uh, is a loaded one. The audience would like to know, what has been the hardest part of this crisis for you? What leadership lesson have you had to exercise the most? And who has impressed you as a leader the most throughout all this? Okay, the hardest lesson uh, has been um, this uh, mega wake-up call about how humanity is so fragile. And I'm not saying this at, you know, at any philosophical way. Part of it is philosophical. But you know, it's home. My family is at risk. I mean, what if I don't make it? This is serious stuff. So, so it's a wake-up call on the reality of life itself. That life is not a journey. It's just one challenge after the other. And that... Uh, uh, it's a manifestation of how strong we have to be for our sake and the sake of other people. Life is not a game. This is not a game. Now, it's not a depressing journey at the same time, but you have to take it seriously. When you're having fun, you have to be very serious and wise about it. And you, when you're not having fun, when you're receiving end of the tragedy or, or the danger, you're also, you can't take it uh, you can serious. You cannot take it lightly. You have to be serious about it. So, so that what struck me, it, at least in my lifetime, is the first time I, f I experience emotionally and intellectually, right, and spiritually, something of this magnitude. Uh, I'm sure people in World War II had their own problems, but I don't feel, even in World War II, 8 billion people, it's different context. We weren't 8 billion in World War II, and I don't think uh, out of the you know, people who were there, a billion people were you know, scared uh, sitting at home. This is this is a huge thing. And especially that this is not going to be the first time and the last time. It's going to happen again. So I have to be ready for what comes again. Um, so the, the other part of the question, remind me of the other part. The other part is who inspires me most uh, in terms of um, who exercise leadership now? On a global uh, scale, yeah. yes. on a global scale, uh, I must say, nobody, on a global scale, I haven't seen a single quote-unquote, you know, who call themselves leaders, who would come on TV and make a speech that talks about what's happening from a human perspective, and not only talks about it, acts, but, you know, at exercising leadership to lobby and mobilize other people of authority, you know, bring them together, you know, shake the world, guys, we can't just be everybody for their own now. We have to come together. I haven't seen this happening. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not. Maybe that there are situations, you know, there's super emergency and people have to put the fire that's at home, you know, they will have to, uh, they have to put that fire uh, off first. But people who strike me as global, you know, leaders of the global perspective, none. Now, uh, and that's what we have to think about. That's, that's why we need to rethink leadership all over again. Because that's the kind of leadership that will save the world in the years to come. The second point is, uh, have some people ex ex uh, impressed me on the domestic level? Yes, of course they have. Um, some more than others in being more effective and efficient. I mean, look at Germany. It's wonderful what they're doing. And China, considering their own structure and the way they do, they do things and their culture and you know, the governance system, they did brilliantly. And South Korea is doing great. Singapore is doing great. We should learn from all these, uh, all these examples. Although each one has a different culture when they exercise governance, so they're brilliant examples on how people handled this crisis on a local level. And this should be exercised. This should be studied and investigated and researched. And papers have to be written on this, because we need to learn. This is this is an amazing. We should spend ten years trying to learn through empirical research. You know, how do we integrate what we learn, how do we conclude, make conclusions and integrate them into our, our, our bulk of knowledge and our consciousness. But as I said, globally, I guess, where is G7, G20, where is the UN Security Council that used to meet for, any, you know, for many other easier reasons? Where is the UN? Where is the UN in Geneva? Where is the UN in New York? It is these times, at least to give, to send a message to the global community that somebody is doing something, right? Now, I'm not, I mean, this is not, I'm not, uh, uh, this is not criticism. 
It's just observations that we should we should think about and we should learn from, right? Because we're talking about a different level of leadership now. We're talking about global leadership that puts entire humanity in perspective while you're exercising your domestic and local and national leadership. And, uh, and maybe in the next few months or so, when people are awake from, you know, processing this and uh, over the panic stage, maybe such people will, 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 will come on stage. And maybe when this is even quiet, you know, it's over, maybe some people will come and say, guys, let's come together as a global community, UN or other bodies, and, and a scientific community, universities, you know, think tank, come together and see what we can learn out of this and turn this into policies at a local level, a national level, and at a, at a global level. And I'm hopeful that that's, that should happen and will happen. That's why I said I'm optimistic. Despite all these costs in a human level and financial level, career level, job level, economic level, I think after this, after this, there is all reason to think and to be hopeful right, and work for that, we should be in a better state. Life after this will change, yes. Not dramatically, it will change. But it should change to the better. Now, one moment. There's a, there's a caveat here. It's also a case that under stress, all the demons will come out. Take the family. If the family isn't under stress, all the demons of all past issues in all previously unsolved relationships and pending issues will come to the surface. So this is also is expected to happen because the society is under so much, so much stress, right? So this will happen. So we have to know how to. We will need to learn how to handle this. Make sure that these demons do not, you know, overwhelm us and keep things positive, right? And learn from this and make it into, into create a better reality and that's the challenge of leadership.